presentation in our seminar um, on information diffusion on complex networks. Uh, thank you very much, Leif, and uh, thanks to you and also to Andreas for setting this up. Um, it's a strange period where there are very few seminars, so I think it's very nice to be able to meet our colleagues online and hear uh, some of the latest developments. So I'm going to be talking about information diffusion on complex networks, and this actually means that I have to explain two things, information diffusion and complex networks, and I'll do this in, in several trials. I'll start with... Uh, explaining what complex networks are, and then I will say something about uh, various forms of information diffusion uh, that we might be interested in. Okay. So complex networks in general are uh, very large graphs, and uh, therefore in, in mathematical terms, we'll be thinking about taking limits to infinity, uh, but they're also highly heterogeneous, and that actually means that, that the various uh, vertices in these networks play rather different roles. So, for example, on the right, you see the Internet, and on the Internet, you have the, uh, the backbone routers, and they're much more important for uh, Internet traffic than sort of the, the, the average router that is present uh, on the Internet. And on the left, you see yeast protein interaction networks, and also there, uh, we actually know that there are some uh, proteins that play a much more profound role in uh, the biological function that these uh, uh, proteins have. Uh, and I think this is just a reality that we see in, in many of the real world networks. Uh, and that is that they are rather uh, heterogeneous uh, in their nature. Now, many of these networks come from various different origins and we'll, we'll see uh, some other uh, examples again later on. So you might think that they have actually nothing in common, so why study them all simultaneously? But actually it turns out that uh, many of these uh, real-world complex networks have some unexpected commonality, and that's what we would like to be focusing upon. So one of the things that, uh, that many of these networks share is, as I've said, that they're highly heterogeneous. And more particularly, if you look at um, the degree distribution of the, the various vertices in these networks, uh, then, the, the, as I said, this is highly heterogeneous, but, it, but also it seems that in many examples, this degree distribution actually follows a power law. And that's, of course, rather remarkable because we know that power laws are very important uh, because they, they are examples of uh, probability distributions that have uh, only a finite number of uh, finite moments. Uh, and therefore, you can imagine that uh, having uh, uh, one of these power laws means that you actually have a, a high amount of variability in the degree structure in these networks. And I, I've shown here two examples. The left, examples com the left example comes from the in degree of uh, uh, a crawl on the World Wide Web. And it's, uh, it's uh, uh, conjectured that the in degree has uh, this power law behavior. And we certainly see a picture that, that looks very much like this. On the right, we see the uh, degree distribution in internet. And as you can see, the, uh, the uh, degree distribution is, is much more smooth. And that's because uh, uh, my, the colleague who made this picture, Dima Kriokov, um, actually binned the picture in order to smoothen it out a bit. Now, we've drawn these uh, pictures in a very particular style, and that's the kind of style that you will see in many of the applied uh, papers on, on network science, and this is sometimes called a log-log plot. And the reason is that many of these pictures in a log-log plot start looking like a straight line. And a straight line, a perfect straight line, would mean that the proportion pk of vertices with k satisfies that pk is a constant times an inverse power of k. And as you can imagine, uh, this, of course, uh, decays when, uh, when k tends to infinity, but it decays fairly slowly. So that actually means that in a, in a very large network, you're still going to see vertices of actually pretty large degree. And that's exactly what you see in these two pictures. And even more uh, astonishing, there are many claims that say that uh, uh, the empirical values of the power law exponent, that of course plays a very profound role, um, should be in between two and three. Three. There's a lot of discussion about whether this is the case or not, um, but if this were to be the case, tau being in between two and three, if uh, the, the pk uh, would be a probability distribution, it actually means that the variance of the, the random variable that pk is the probability mass function of is infinite. And of course, we know that uh, uh, processes with infinite variance um, are rather peculiar, and we'll see that uh, uh, in more detail a, a bit later on. 
So this is one of the properties that uh, many of these networks have. The second property is that these networks, even though they're extremely large, are rather small in the sense that sort of typical paths between pairs of vertices are relatively short. So here we describe the, uh, the intrinsic or the graph distances between pairs of vertices. And what this means is that you pick a, a vertex and you pick another vertex, you assume that they are connected, and then you count sort of the, the minimum number of edges that you need in order to hop from the first vertex to the other vertex. Now, if you do this for all the different vertices in the graph and you put that in a nice uh, uh, histogram and you, you renormalize that histogram in, in such a way that you, you get a probability distribution, then you see pictures of the kind that I'm showing, showing now. So the left again corresponds to the World Wide Web and the right corresponds to the Internet Movie Database from 2003. So what we see is that these, uh, that these graph distances are extremely small. They're much smaller than the size of the network. You should really think about the networks being of size uh, several millions. And uh, if you see distances of order seven or eight, then this is, this is very small compared to the size of the graph. And that's what is generally called the small world paradigm. And we see that many of these uh, networks uh, do satisfy this small world paradigm. And you should bear in mind that this really is different compared to the, the, the type of worlds that we're used to. Uh, I mean, if you're thinking about, let's say, a square on Z2, if you want it to have n vertices, then actually uh, it's a square of size square root of n by square root of n. And if you pick two vertices uniformly at random, then the, then the graph distance between them will be of order the square root of the number of uh, vertices in your network. So for example, in the Internet Movie Database, that would correspond to the square root of roughly a million and therefore roughly a thousand. And you really see the distances are much, much, much smaller than this. So there's something uh, special happening here. Now here's some material. I don't want to make too much uh, advertisement, but uh, if you want to know something about sort of real world application of networks, you might have a look at network at the network pages and I'll show a demo a bit later on. Uh, Right. So that actually gave the very first uh, explanation of what it means to be a complex network. I mean, we still need to think about how to model that mathematically, and that's what we'll do uh, a bit later on. But let's first think about information diffusion and in particular about smallest weight problems. So in, in many applications, what you would like is you, you would like to move something from uh, a source to a destination. Uh, this could be uh, a gossip, uh, it could be a, a virus, maybe you don't want to spread that, but, uh, or it could be uh, uh, an email message where you want to transfer a packet of, uh, of information. And Often in these settings, it takes a little bit of time or it takes a bit of cost in order for you to use a particular edge in your network and to transfer the message along. Uh, uh, certainly, if you're thinking about the gossip, it will take you some time to tell uh, the gossip to uh, any of your friends. So these are, are then called the traversal times. So if you want to know how this information uh, is diffusing over the network, then you want to track as a function of time, if, uh, where, where, the, uh, uh, where the information is located when it starts from a certain source um, in, in the network. And of course, uh, the, the, the information is going to arrive at a certain destination by the path that actually minimizes the traversal times along the edges. So we immediately are led to smallest weight problems. Now, this is not the only thing that we're often interested in. Uh, we're sometimes also interested in the number of edges that are being used uh, along this optimal path. So, for example, in Internet, uh, this number of edges is a good uh, measure for the amount of delay that you're, being, that you're experiencing uh, for the traffic. Um, but if we're thinking about traversing um, uh, a rumor or, or a virus, then uh, the number of edges that is being used also signifies how many intermediate people are uh, either hearing the rumor or being infected. And that's certainly something that we would like to uh, know about. So that actually uh, gives rise to two problems, namely what is the, the, the structure of the, the, the smallest weight uh, of 
uh, traversing information between source and destination, and also how many edges are involved in such a short weight path. Now, in, throughout this talk, we'll actually assume that these edge weights are IID random variables, and that means that there's actually double randomness in this problem, and, and problems with double randomness are particularly interesting. So here we have double randomness because of the, the randomness in the process, in particular the, the randomness in the edge weights, on the one hand, on the other hand, we will also be modeling our networks through random graphs, and therefore also the graph itself is random. And you actually want to know what the interplay is between these two sources of randomness. And I would like to say that I, you know, we, we've been looking at uh, uh, small weight problems uh, before, uh, ultra small uh, world properties. And of course, you should realize that, that you can also go, go back to the uh, uh, graph distances by just assuming that every edge has, has weight one. So this is a particular instance of this uh, uh, smallest weight problem. All right, so here we're talking about information diffusion. And what you should bear in mind is that if you're actually uh, putting IID traversal times on the edges, then what we're thinking about is a process that is sometimes called first passage percolation, which has attracted a lot of attention uh, for first passage percolation on ZD. And here we're doing first passage percolation on a more uh, uh, general or heterogeneous uh, uh, network. Now, in particular, uh, first passage percolation has attracted a lot of attention in the case where the uh, edge weights are exponentially distributed. And the reason for that is that uh, exponential distributions have the memoryless property and therefore the whole growth process of who can be reached has a nice Markovian structure. That is actually uh, particularly nice. But of course, in many real world systems, there's no reason whatsoever to assume um, that the uh, traversal times along all, all of the edges are uh, exponential distributions and therefore will also be uh, varying these uh, edge traversal times. So we're looking at a, a rather general first passage percolation problem on uh, a general network. So this is what I mean with information diffusion on a network. Now I would like to go back to my internet example that will actually feature throughout the talk. Uh, of course, we can also think about diseases and how they spread and I will uh, spend some words on that uh, a bit later on, but I have to warn you that I'm certainly not an expert in that field. Um, but uh, uh, if we want to think about uh, internet traffic, then clearly what we have is a, a problem where we're trying to um, uh, send out a lot of information over the edges in a network. In, the, in this case, the edges of the network are the physical cables that exist between routers. And of course, it's not entirely obvious how this, write, how this writing, uh, routing takes place. So that actually makes the problem somewhat uh, uh, difficult. Um, but there is a little bit of literature about this. I mean, most of the routers in, in the true internet are actually produced by Cisco. And uh, uh, Cisco has recommendations for the link weights that actually do play a role in internet traffic. And uh, the Cisco recommendation is that the proportion of, of link weights with a value at most B uh, should be equal uh, to the proportion of uh, uh, cables that have a certain uh, capacity, at least one over B. And here in capacity, you should really think about uh, the bandwidth of the cables. So it, it really becomes very physical. And of course, we, we have no idea what the empirical properties are of the, uh, uh, the, the, the bandwidths of cables in the internet, and therefore we'll just be assuming that these are IID uh, distributions. Of course, this is uh, 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 certainly a simplification of the real world because you can imagine that the, uh, the, the bandwidths in, uh, in, in the real physical internet cables have some dependencies. So the IID nature might actually not be uh, uh, particularly correct. But it's like with statistics. You start with the simplest possible case and then you try to work from there. Now, this is a, a picture that has been inspiring us in order to, to look at this problem. And what this, what this shows is what is sometimes called the hop count in internet. And this you can actually measure through a device which is called trace route. And in trace route, you, you send an email message from a certain source to a certain destination. And not only will you see that the, the, the message actually arrives at the destination, but you will also get uh, all the IP addresses of the intermediary uh, routers that have been used in order to send the traffic along from source to destination. So if you start sort of plotting how many of such intermediary routers are being used, you get a picture 
alike the one that we're currently seeing. And uh, what you see is that these distances are quite a bit larger than the, the, the proper di graph distances that you see in many networks. So there's some uh, uh, routing taking place in the internet that, is a, that seems to be a bit different from uh, graph distances. And what you also see is if you, if you squeeze your eyes half shut, um, is that this actually looks a lot like a, a Gaussian distribution or maybe a Poisson distribution. And in fact, what you see, what you can empirically observe here is that in this data set, the mean and the, and the variance are not very far apart. So uh, uh, they're, they're of an equal order of magnitude. So it really does look a lot like a Poisson distribution. So the question is, how could such a, a central limit theorem in such a data set uh, arise? Can we find an appropriate model that might explain something like this? Okay, so the very general setting uh, that we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at the smallest weight between two uniformly vertices, uniformly uh, chosen vertices in a collection of n vertices in total. And we'll think about n as being very large. And in fact, we'll be taking limits as n tends to infinity. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll choose our, our starting point and our, our destination as being typical, and therefore we'll choose them uniformly at random. But we will be assuming that they're connected because otherwise, of course, no traffic can flow between the two. And then what we're interested in is what the minimal weight is of the path connecting um, the source to the destination. So the, the weight of a path is the sum of the edge weights in that path. That's actually the quantity that we see right over here. Y e is the edge weight of, of edge e. And uh, we're summing over all the edges that are in my path. So pi is a path that, uh, that connects my starting point, which is denoted by u1, to my destination node, which is denoted by u2. So that's one thing that we're going to be very much interested in. And if we're talking about a rumor, this would describe the amount of time it takes for the rumor to spread from the source u1 to uh, a random destination u2. Um, but we're also interested in how many people are involved in sort of traversing this rumor. And that's what is called the hop count. Uh, and we'll denote that by Hn. And that's the number of edges in the smallest weight path. Um, and what we will be uh, assuming is uh, that our, uh, our weights are continuous. And uh, that has the nice feature that actually this, uh, this minimal path will be unique. So we can actually talk about the number of edges in it. Uh, if you allow for distributions that are discrete, it might be that there are several paths of equal uh, weight that connect source. If that is the case, then it's, it's much harder to talk about the hop count because they actually might have different uh, number of, uh, of edges in them. And um, of course, you can do this on a general graph. And as I said, first passage percolation has been investigated a lot on ZD. Did we lose the speaker? Yeah, I think we've lost the speaker, yeah. Okay, let's see if he finds us again quickly. Oh, and there he is. Can you still hear me? Now you're back. Yeah. Um, Just about. Something went wrong. I especially uh, went down to sit in my living room where our internet is best, uh, but still, it's not particularly good. I don't know why. I'm hoping that uh, uh, nothing is going to happen uh, uh, now. Can you hear me well? Very good now. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So this is where, where I was stopping. Uh, you can formulate this problem on a general graph. And what I would like to do now is I would, uh, would like to um, restrict to a particular setting, uh, a particular setting that has the same level of heterogeneity that you see in, in real world networks. And this is called the configuration model. And the nice thing about the configuration model is that it's a, it's a model in which you can vary the, the size of the network, the number of vertices in it, uh, but you can also vary the, the degree structure in the network. 
So we're just going to be assuming that we have a, a setting where we know how many vertices we have and we know what the, the number of neighbors is of each of these different vertices. And this is just uh, what is given. So for example, you could uh, uh, obtain that from, uh, from a data set of a, uh, a real world network. And then you of course know how many vertices there are in the network and you know how many neighbors each of the vertices has. In some cases, it will be convenient to take these degrees to be IID. That's, of course, a very natural setting for, for probabilists, but we won't always be doing that. What we will be interested in is settings where um, these degrees obey power laws in the, in the way that I've described in my scale-free uh, paradigm uh, in order to be able to, to discuss um, the level of heterogeneity that is in that is present in the in, in the models. What you should bear in mind is uh, this heterogeneity is measured in terms of a parameter tau. It's a power law exponent, and the smaller tau is the more heterogeneous the network is. Very large tau's means it's more or less like all the described yet. Uh, what the model is, but what you should bear in mind with is that each of these vertices now has a certain degree and you think of little stubs as coming out of that vertex and you pair these stubs uniformly at random. And I would like to actually show that uh, through a, a simulation on uh, the network pages. So this is the network pages uh, a site. Uh, Demos that allow you to, to demonstrate uh, how these, uh, how such a configuration model is being obtained. So this is one realization. I'm going to be drawing another. What you see is all the vertices, and all the vertices have little sticks coming out, and you pair these little sticks uniformly at random then of course you get something which is uh, fairly strange, but it is sometimes called a force field layout. And then you see certain vertices that have a, a slightly higher degree. Here the maximum degree is five. And you see that they're pairing uniformly at random. You actually have very little to say about how the pairing occurs. And then of course it could be the case that some vertices are the self loop or multiple um, as sort of small circles. So let's just do this once more. And then you see how the, uh, the half edges are being paired to one another. It goes pretty quickly. And then in the end, this is what you get. And in this case, it turns out that there are no self loops, but there is one pair of vertices that has a multiple edge between them. So this is what the model is. And here we again have this description, but now in words, where we describe that we're pairing in that respect. Now, of course, the thing that I didn't explain is how one should choose these degrees. And uh, you can have just uh, degrees in, in the back of your mind. That's perfectly fine. Generally, when we assume that these degrees are somewhat regular. So we want to uh, be able to take a limit as to uh, have a fixed proportion of vertices of a given degree. And that's actually what this uh, signifies. And also what you see here in the second uh, item is that the average degree, so the, the average of all the degrees in the graph actually converges to the, the expectation of this limiting degree. So that actually means that there are not too many vertices of too large degree. Remco, uh, could you All perhaps right. uh, turn off your video? That might increase your bandwidth. Yes. Maybe you too as well, Life, although I don't think that's the problem. I think we don't matter, but we can yeah. try. Yes, I can. Let's see whether that works better. 
Okay. Um, maybe you can go back. Property, of course, we're interested is that uh, uh, um, they're generally in, a, in the world will basically all connected to one another. So you would believe that the giant component of social relations is everything. And in this case, this turns out to be the case when, when a certain uh, parameter which we denote by new is strict larger than one. You can interpret this parameter in a vertex, loops and multiple edges, but we typically saw only a few of them. Then the, the ratio model has random graph. You're very free to choose um, the, the particular degrees in your model, the, the influence of the degree structure on the properties of the network. And let me give a very first example of that. In terms of the, the graph distances in the network, it's, uh, distances, uh, no, no traversal times, but just at shortest GN is the graph distance between a uniformly chosen pair of connected vertices in this configuration model. Different uh, uh, settings, and the first setting is when. The, the degrees have a finite second moment, giant component, and in that case, uh, the graph distances grow logarithmically in n at a certain loop. On the other hand, uh, in the case where there's infinite variance degrees, so tos in between two and three, uh, this actually means that there are vertices of very large degree, much larger than the square root of the size of the network. And you can imagine that, uh, that, that such uh, vertices play a very profound role, and in particular that they trace, and it turns out that in, in such a case, uh, log n. So if n becomes very large, log n is of course a lot smaller, but log log n becomes really a lot smaller. So you could see this as a way of quantifying the uh, small world paradigm that we see in in real world networks. So times and Remco, uh, Remco, and there sorry, we were interested sorry, in both the weight. Remco, could you just check if there's anything else on your yeah, computer open? I can hear you. Yeah, anything on your computer open, like your your the, the web pages you had. Maybe close those down in case it's okay. trying to transfer data back and forward on your computer. Yeah, I'll close everything. Don't close Zoom, of course. Yeah, I didn't have a lot open. I can close this one. Okay. Thanks. Is that better? Uh, let's see. <laughs> For now, yes. Let's see. Yeah, the, the problem is that I don't hear myself whether I'm coming through or not. It does say that my internet can be uh, to the router. Let's try to do that. Yeah. I'll press on, it's okay. And let's see whether that is any better. All right. So uh, I was talking about first passage percolation on the configuration model. And this is the very first result. It's a rather general statement. And the statement says that um, we're taking these, uh, these edge weights to be IID, but they have a completely uh, general continuous distribution otherwise. 
So they could be exponential, they could be uniform, they could be, doesn't really matter. Distribution uh, set here. Um, in this case, uh, we know that the, uh, uh, the minimum weight to connect, uh, so the traversal time to connect source to destination grows logarithmically with a certain uh, pre -prama. And actually this turns out to be always the case. On the other hand, if you look at the number of edges in the shortest weight path, this behaves uh, uh, rather differently. And uh, it turns out that if you look at this number of edges, again, this grows uh, logarithmically, but the fluctuations are much larger in the sense that its variance is, is also logarithmic. So that means that the fluctuations are of size square root of log n. And in fact, there is a central limit theorem there in the background. So the number of edges on the smallest weight path obeys a central limit theorem where the mean grows logarithmically and the variance grows logarith logarithmically as well. And one of the things we see is that these results are, are completely general and they, they depend very little on the precise structure of the degree distribution nor on the precise structure of the edge weight distribution. So this is what I, what I denote with universality here. And again, uh, this picture for the hop count in internet, um, one of the things we see is that there is a nice central limit theorem in the number of edges of the shortest weight path, just like we see a central limit theorem here in the number of edges in, in our path, okay? Now this is of course uh, the case when, um, when we assume that the, uh, the variance of the degree distribution is finite, when it is infinite, and now we're going to be uh, for the moment assuming that there are IAD exponential uh, uh, weights, so this is the Markovian setting, then it turns out actually that you can uh, traverse information from source to, def to destination in amount of time that is tight. So that actually means that if, if uh, irrespective of how large the network is, in a finite amount of time, you will actually uh, be able to send the information from source to destination, from a uniform source to a uniform destination. Um, while at the same time, there still is a central limit theorem of the number of edges in this, is, in this path. So that actually means that on the one hand, there are still a lot of edges in the path, but their weight become increasingly smaller in such a way that the total weights along the path, the optimal path, are actually summable. So that's actually uh, uh, quite different and, and quite uh, rather special as well. So you could say that if we're talking about routing here, that this is super efficient routing. All right. And uh, you can extend that a little bit, that result, um, by looking at the, uh, um, the proportion of vertices that can be reached uh, in a given time. And here it's, uh, it's the, the proportion of vertices that can be reached at time gamma log n plus some, some extra parameter t. And that proportion converges to a positive uh, number. And this positive number is in this time t minus some, uh, uh, some random variable that somehow indicates how quickly the, uh, uh, the process started flowing away from the, from the source location. And I actually wanted to draw this. Uh -huh. So what you should think of is that this epidemic curve um, is a function that actually goes up like this, and it typically goes up exponentially, then it flattens out. And in the end, it reaches, in this case, the whole population. Um, so this is uh, exactly uh, like the S-curves that we see nowadays for, uh, uh, for the spread of diseases on these networks. And it's particularly this setting in the beginning which, where you have an exponential growth that is particularly relevant for, for disease spread. All right. Oh, uh, I want to erase all of that. Okay. So, um, I've described also what happens uh, in the setting where you have exponential uh, traversal times um, and uh, infinite uh, variance uh, uh, degrees. 
So there actually the more general results uh, are true uh, in the sense that they, you have a, a very efficient routing in many of these networks um, under rather general uh, assumptions, namely that a certain continuous time branching process that we'll say a little bit more about uh, a bit later on um, is explosive. And that actually means that the continuous time branching process reaches an infinite number of particles in a fixed amount of time. And there is a, a, an explicit criterion that will tell you whether uh, such a, a, a continuous time branching process is explosive or not in a nice paper by Amini, De Vroy, Griffiths and Olver. Uh, and it's this uh, 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 sum, sum that needs to be finite. So you take the distribution function of y, you inverse it, and then you take this uh, uh, doubly exponentially decaying function in it. And if this sum is finite, and that's actually going to be true for the majority of h weight distributions, then actually you, you have a, a finite explosion time. Now, of course, that's not always the case. And the simplest example where this is not the case is an example where your edge weight distribution has a, a, <clears throat> a minimum of its support that is strictly positive. For example, you could take one plus a, a certain random variable that has a, a non-negative random variable x. And in this case, it turns out that there's something really weird going on because it turns out that the, the minimum number of edges in the optimal path grows exactly in the same way as uh, the graph distances, again, log log n, even with the same constant. And it turns out that uh, uh, this number is actually tight around this leading order value. So what does this mean? Well, we know that the shortest path is of the same order, again, log log n divided by this absolute value of log tau minus two. But now you, you don't only want, want to have a path that has as few edges, but you also want to have a path for which the sum of the edge weights is actually quite small as well. And uh, it turns out that that is simultaneously possible to have a path that has both very few edges, as well as has a, a, a sum of, of additional edge weights xe that is also very small. That's actually quite nice. And the most complete picture in the case of infinite variance is by, in a paper by uh, uh, Adrians and, and Komiati in JSP. And this is, of course, not in 2980, it's in 2018. All right. So I would like to devote a little bit of time in my uh, remaining few minutes uh, about uh, the proof. So one of the nice things about the configuration model is that you actually can describe rather closely how the local neighborhoods of such a, a configuration model behave. So remember that we were starting our infection or our, our uh, um, first passage percolation problem from a uniformly chosen uh, source. Uh, we denote this by U1. And of course, the, dis the distribution of this is just going to be the degree of a uniformly chosen vertex, which, is, uh, which we denoted by the N. And we've assumed that this is very close in distribution to some limiting random variable capital D. Okay, so now we know how many neighbors a typical uh, source vertex has. But now, what about the number of forward neighbors or further neighbors that any of its neighbors have? Well, how, how do we construct that? Well, the way how, how that works in the configuration model is that any of the, the neighbors of uh, a vertex are obtained by pairing a half edge to a uniformly chosen other half edge. That actually means that a, a vertex that has many half edges incident to it, and therefore has a very large degree, is more likely to be chosen. And in fact, a vertex that has degree uh, k is k more likely to be chosen compared to a vertex that has degree 1. So that actually means that if you look at the number of forward neighbors of any of the neighbors of my original source location, then uh, the probability that this uh, uh, vertex has another uh, k vert uh, um, forward neighbors, well, that first of all means that its degree needs to be k plus one, because you use up one of the half edges in order to create the edge between uh, the vertex u1 and, uh, uh, the, and its neighbor. So its degree needs to be k plus one. And then, of course, we need to choose a vertex of that degree. And there's so many of those vertices. And then the probability of picking any vertex of them is its number of half edges, which is now k plus one, divided by the total number of half edges half edges, which is just the sum of the degrees. OK, 
okay? So if we multiply, uh, we see here two sums, if we multiply both sums by one over n, our degree conditions are guaranteeing that these uh, fractions actually converge. So the proportion of vertices with degree k plus one converges to the probability that my asymptotic degree distribution has a value exactly k plus one. Whereas the average degree, that's actually exactly the same thing as the expectation of dn, will converge to the expectation of d. And what we see on the right-hand side is a nice distribution, and it's, uh, it's sometimes described as being the size bias distribution, because we multiply by a value, but in fact it's a size bias distribution minus one. So the vertex that we attach to has a degree that is, has a size bias distribution, but of course you lose one of its half edges in creating the edge from uh, the original source. And of course, if we start looking at this, this random variable in more detail, and if we compute its expectation, then we get exactly this value nu. And remember that nu is larger than one was exactly uh, what signifies whether um, there is a giant component or not in this graph. All right. So what we see is that the forward number of neighbors of, uh, of neighbors of U1 are close to being independent because every time will number of, of half, and you should bear in mind that N is extremely large and therefore the total number of half edges still present in the system is extremely large. So the very few that are being used up in order to create some of these connections are basically vanishing compared to the, 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 the large amount. And therefore, all of these different uh, forward degree distributions of all the neighbors are close to being IID. But then we can go one level further. And what we see is that the neighbors of the neighbors uh, are again, uh, the, the, the number of forward neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors are again IID samples of the same distribution, which is the size bias distribution minus one. So that actually means that if you look at these neighborhoods, they look a lot like a branching process. The branching process is a bit peculiar because the, the root has a, has a different offspring distribution compared to everybody else. Uh, but uh, aside from the root, everybody has the same IID offspring distribution, and it's this size bias distribution minus one. Now, of course, this is the sort of the local neighborhood structure. If you want to in, in understand first passage percolation on such a network, what we need to do is we need to assign edge weights to uh, all of the edges, like we do in the graph. And if the, the second moment of the degree distribution is finite, it means that our branching process actually has a finite mean, and then we know that these continuous time branching processes actually grow exponentially. Um, and it's also known that if you look at the, the hop count, uh, that's going to be closely related to the central limit theorem for the profile of the generation sizes in a continuous time branching process at a given time. So we can sort of relate the properties that we see in our random graph to properties that we know about continuous time branching processes. Now, when tau is in between two and three, you have infinite variance degrees. That actually means that this B uh, is going to have an infinite expectation. So that means that our branching process, which has this size bias distribution, uh, now has an infinite mean. And infinite mean branching processes are very special. And in such infinite mean branching processes, we have that the continuous time branching process can actually be explosive, meaning that the continuous time branching process reaches an infinite number of vertices in a finite amount of time. And if this doesn't occur, we call it the conservative. All right. Um, so what is now the central ingredient in the whole proof? Well, first of all, what we would like, to, what, what we have tried to do is to untangle the relationship between network topology, here described by the degree distribution, and the behavior of a process on it, in this case, first passage percolation. And what we see is that this high amount, high amount of heterogeneity that we see in many real world networks, also in the random graph plays a very particular role, and infinite variance degrees have different behavior than uh, finite variance degrees. Of course, you may wonder whether sort of these insights can be used in the real world. Well, you have to be really careful for that. And that the, the reason for that is that uh, the configuration model is in many respects not such a good model for, for the real world. The reason is that many real world networks actually have a, a high amount of sort of uh, small cliques and, and triangles and so on. And that's what you generally do not see in the configuration model. 
but still many of the results that we're seeing in the configuration model actually hold much more generally and the configuration model certainly serves as a nice sort of example model and uh, can be used as a stepping stone for other results to be proved. Now, of course, uh, an open problem and a much more difficult problem would be to investigate settings where the edge weights are actually dependent random variables. And then it's not so clear how, the robust, how robust the results are uh, with respect to these dependencies. Now, first passage percolation can also be seen as a model for the spread of the disease, and then it would be called an SI model, susceptible infective. And this is a model in which uh, anybody who's in, infected will remain being infectious uh, all the time. Now, that's, of course, not a very realistic model for the spread of a virus, um, because in viruses, you, you generally have a, a, a contagious period that is only finite. Uh, but actually, you can combine uh, results uh, uh, for first passage percolation together with results for all. Ordinary to also say some for the spread of diseases. And a few of the, the important names are Frank Ball, David Searle, uh, Peter Trapman, uh, and, uh, and, and many others also in France. Um, looking back at the pictures that we've seen, it, it, I've been arguing that uh, infinite variance degrees are very relevant for many of the real world, let's say, electronic uh, networks but they may actually not be so relevant for or realistic for, for the spread of proper diseases. And the reason is that, for example, in the coronavirus, what we see is that initially things grow exponentially. And that's not something that, that goes very well together with the explosive nature of what we see in general in infinite variance uh, degree configuration models. Uh, so apparently, uh, if we look at social networks, this, this exponential growth is much more relevant there. Now, there are many more open problems. I don't have a lot of time left. Um, so let me go to the conclusions. Um, a few conclusions about networks. Many real world networks share important features. Uh, they tend to be scale free and they tend to be small worlds. There's often a suggestion of infinite variance degrees, particularly in many of the uh, electronic networks, such as the World Wide Web and Internet. And there's many models invented to model or explain these properties. And, and here in my talk, I focused on the configuration model, but there are many more other models out there that sort of take different aspects of such real world networks into account. And what we see about these weighted distances is that they're remarkably, remarkably similar across models. This is something that we haven't really discussed, but one of the things that we have seen is that uh, sort of in the finite variance regime, actually this first passage percolation uh, behavior is, is remarkably similar across different uh, edge weight distributions or degree uh, distributions. And we see that also uh, when applying these ideas to other random graph models. And there is of course a, a main difference when you have infinite variance degrees, you, you can have explosive settings, whereas you have exponential growth or uh, uh, exponential growth of, of the spread All right, that was it. Let me so, try uh, to start my video. Yeah, thank you very much, Jamco. Again. This was now a little bit unlucky, but we knew it's going to happen sometime that the internet connection is not good enough. Um, I saw questions in the chat. Um, so everybody has the possibility to unmute um, as before. Um, do you want to go forward um, asking the question live? So I'm going to start just from, from the chat. Um, Christina asked if it would be a natural, uh, what would be a natural dependence structure for the edge weights? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I don't know. Um, and I think that there's very little uh, data on that. So that actually makes the question difficult. So maybe, you know, if, if you think about the, the, the model as being a model for, for the spread of a disease, maybe then you can think a little bit more uh, about this. 
So for example, you might have people who are socially very active, and I can imagine that they reach all of their neighbors more quickly than people who are less socially active. Right? So then it would mean that in general, the distribution of edges, uh, let's say outgoing edges from a certain source, might be dependent on uh, the precise properties of the, the source node they start from. So you, uh, you, you could think about settings where, where you, you let the dependency uh, occur through uh, the vertices uh, from which the, the edges come. Does that answer the question? I think so. Chris, can you hear anybody? You. Can, can I ask uh, a slight follow up to that? Yep, sure. Uh, so, I mean, you, you sort of mentioned that um, in a way, this, this, this lack of cliques or, or sort of small, small groups is what's missing from the configuration model. On the other hand, physical models where we understand local dependency, I'm thinking things like easing model are, are yep. well, well studied. Is there some way of imposing some sort of geometry on the network so you have sort of locally a sort of easing model, but with these long range independent links as, as well? So I'm thinking more about a setting in which a model can have lots of uh, uh, little triangles. Uh, so, so vertices are part of, of uh, a large collection of triangles and maybe even larger cliques. So I, I don't really see the connection to an easing model there, but of course you can, you can try to, to put that into your random graph model. And then the question of course becomes whether let's say the kind of properties that we currently see in the configuration model, whether they still remain on being true in such a setting where you have uh, much more uh, a cliquish like behavior, while at the same time keeping an average degree that is not too large, right? Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, uh, Amanda? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it was a crazy suggestion, so don't worry about it. <laughs> so. I, I would have to think about how to do that using an easing model. So I see a blue hand raised, Patanier, so I'm going to un unmute you. Oh, now. hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, Remco, this is Parthenil from Bangalore. Ah, yes. Yeah, thanks for very nice Nice to hear talk. you, Parthenil. Yeah, so um, my question was, uh, you said that dependence among the age weights is sort of normal, perhaps, to assume. But is there any literature on that? Like what kind of dependence would you model or is it long range, short range? Would you expect same result? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I don't know of any literature. That, that's for one. Um, in, in fact, uh, it, it's not entirely obvious in what setting you could actually measure these kind of things. Yeah. So for true. example, in internet, in principle, you might be able to do this. But I don't know whether there's any data sets out there that will tell you. Okay. And nor is there any theoretical result, as you said. No, not, not as far as I'm aware. I, I can imagine that, you know, there's lots of people trying to model disease spreads. So I can imagine that there is a lot of data on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of how, what the variability is of uh, people when they're infected uh, how they spread the disease to, to their neighbors. And I can mm -hmm. imagine that as highly heterogeneous and depends strongly on the, on the person. And that would create a, a particular dependent structure in, in the traversal times along the edges. Yeah, yeah, of course. But again, I, I don't know of, of data there, but I would be surprised if that doesn't exist. Okay, thank you. If anybody in the audience has to contribute to this question, just wait, raise your hand quickly and I could unmute you as well. Wait, wait, wait. So I think we don't have further questions in the chat. So um, as before, I'm going to unmute all of you so that Remco and Amanda uh, again can collect their well-deserved applause of all of us. So I think one, two, three, everybody should.
wonderful presentations um, for today. If you are still interested to discuss with anybody in the chat or with the speakers, just go ahead and um, we'll see you next week. <laughs>